coast to coast, border to border, and around the world. It's time for The Bill Alexander Show. The Bill Alexander Show is a guest-driven program where the topics are diverse and entertaining. Laugh and learn while you listen to one of the best hours of online radio. Now, here's your host, Bill Alexander. Hi, everyone. Yours truly, William Eric Alexander. All my friends call me Bill, and welcome to The Bill Alexander Show. Well, today I have a treat for you because I'm going to be talking to someone who's performed with Steve Miller, Brian Wilson, Junior Walker, Jimmy Rogers, and let's see who else, Paul McCartney, Edgar Winner, Dusty Springfield. I could keep on going, it'll take like another 10 or 15 minutes, but I won't do that. And he also performed with Donnie Osmond. Who am I talking about? (laughs) (laughs) Kenny Lee Lewis. Kenny, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's always interesting to hear... uh... People go through my resume and, and pick the names that they want to refer to because everybody has a different flavor that they notice on the list. And that was your list. Now, I have to tell you, uh, Bill, I, uh, I'm just getting over a cold, so I have a little laryngitis. And unfortunately, I might crack a little bit today. That's fine. But my voice is here. But I'm going to sound like Andy Devine once in a while, guys. <laughs> yeah, how are you doing? You know. So but there's there, there's you know. one name on the list I did not mention, and that's okay. someone by the name of Diane Steinberg, who happens to be your wife. Yes, who I had on the program um, a while back, and she yes. said, "She said, Bill, you got to talk to Kenny. You got to get him on the program. You got to talk to him." So here you are, yep. and. I'm looking at your list of people you've performed with. And before we start growing into that, what made you want to go into music? Well, my father was a swing nut and he was um, four after in the war, World War II, that is. And he um, did a lot of dancing with my mother when they would get through making bombers at Lockheed, you know, in the 40s. And so... Uh, they we used to go to the Palladium down in Hollywood, or they'd go out to the casino in Catalina Island, you know, and they would just jitterbug everywhere, and they were just really into swing. So I grew up in a house that had a really good stereo, good record collection. He also played a little drums, guitar, and saxophone. Uh, I only remember him playing a little guitar and drums at one point, but uh, at one point he just kind of let it all go. But at one at one point in his younger years, he wanted to be a musician, obviously. But uh, as it was with World War II and everything, he ended up just be working for the state. And um, so, but we always had Count Basie blaring in the background or, you know, Benny Goodman or Woody Herman. Or, you know, there's always something going on. So I grew up in a house of swing music. And then my brother and sister were folkies in the 60s. And they were learning all the Peter, Paul, and Mary, Kingston Trio. Uh-huh. You know, Brothers Four, some Dylan, you know, Ian and Sylvia, Mamas and the Papas, you know. And so they were playing all those songs at our family functions when I was just a little kid because they were older than me. And I couldn't get my hand around a guitar, so I just had to sit in the corner and sulk while they got all the attention. <laughs> right. So eventually, I, I borrowed a ukulele from my aunt who lived over in Berkeley. We were living in Sacramento at that time. Uh, we were all from L.A. originally. And uh, I was able to teach myself ukulele, and I worked myself into the family act playing ukulele when I was about seven or eight years old. So I have no musical talent whatsoever. That's why I got into radio. That's why I spun spun records for years. And I always wanted to be able to play an instrument. And by the way, I do have a ukulele on the other side of the room over here that I don't know how to play at all. Uh, but it's one of those things for some reason I can't my fingers and my mind I guess don't work at the same time so when you started playing did you have any professional training or did you have lessons or did you just basically teach yourself basically taught myself um, being a teacher for many many years uh, on uh, fretted instruments there is sort of like a a grid manual dexterity blessing that you're given before you're born that translates into that instrument pretty quickly. You can see it when you're having young students come on. Some of them have it, some of them don't. Now, to the ones that don't have it, can they learn how to play? Absolutely. You can teach yourself to do just about anything. It's just like golf or tennis or anything else. But there is a proficiency that I think is blessed upon you before you're born. And if you have that proficiency, it comes really easy. And for me, that was the case. So when did you start playing professionally? Uh, probably when I was about 15, I started doing, uh, 
fraternity parties around the Sacramento area over at UC Davis with a band I had that was called uh, Trout Mask, <laughs> which was an album cover that Captain Beefheart had where he had a big real carp head, head with a top hat. Well, we named our band after that album cover. It was called Trout Mask, which was pretty funny because I ended up being a big fisherman in my life too, so that's just sort of tied in. But so, uh, that was a band. That I was about 15, started playing. You know, we were just, you know, passing the coffee jar around and, you know, c c coffee can around, I should say. Yeah. And, you know, getting 15 bucks here and there, enough to buy gas to get there. And whoever was the oldest in the band who had a permit would be the one that would drive us to the gig. So that's when it started, but I really didn't get into the big dollars until I went into my first, you know, tour when I was about 18 years old and I had moved to L.A. by then. What, what I think is interesting, and, and also I think it's very sad, is that you talk about how you got started, which would have been what, late 60s, early 70s? That would have been about 70 is when I started working okay. professionally. So you hear about these, you hear about these guys and these bands that were these small guy, small groups that would go play these parties. And you, like you said, you played for whatever they did. They passed the hat and everything else. You don't hear that today because you actually worked your way through the, the, I want to say the party circuit and then making your big break when you turned 18. Now, who was the first person you played, played with that would consider you your big break? Um, I would probably say just before doing Diane's album, my wife's album, which was in 1977, uh, with uh, a bunch of big studio guys. I was using, they were using all the guys in Toto, you know, so I met all of them on her record. But prior to doing that record, uh, I was introduced to Jimmy Rogers. Oh, wow. Cody Cole. Yeah. This is sweeter than one. Uh, we went to the Las Vegas. And we played the Tropicana, so that was my first big, big gig, you know, was playing Vegas with him. <laughs> so when you hit the stage in Vegas, did you think to yourself, hey, I finally met, I, 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 I made the big time, and it's all uphill, or it's all downhill from here, or were you just grateful that you had that opportunity? No, I was just grateful I had it, and I knew that there was much bigger things to come. Uh, but it was kind of a nice feeling that I had made myself onto the strip of Vegas, you know, yeah. uh, we only played about two weeks and it wasn't a very full house. He wasn't that popular, but in those days, which was around 1976, 77, yeah. the mob was still running the town and they didn't care, uh, you know, because it was all lost leader because they were making tons of money in the casino. So they could, you know, they could have an act that didn't have a big turnout. It wasn't a big deal for them. So how old were you? How old were you at the time when you played Vegas the first time? Uh, I would say it was probably about 22, I'm going to say. So did you have, as you mentioned, the mob being connected to Vegas, did you have any runs run-ins with them? Or were you uh, just... The closest run-in I had was probably when we were rehearsing one day. The, the bass player and I decided to do some uh, practicing and some rehearsing because we were just bored. So we went up to the stage and... Backstage, there was a door that would go out a fire escape that went down into the parking lot. And we were practicing one day, and there was a knock on this back door uh, that came up from the parking lot. And we were like, what the hell is that? You know, and it kept pounding. So I went over to open it up, and here's this six-foot, beautiful showgirl, completely dressed in the Follies Brigier regalia. And she wanted to audition for the Follies Brigier, which was what they were showing in the Tropicana. And she just wanted to get this gig. So she was already dressed and ready to go. And so I pull her in and I go, who are you? What do you want? You know, she told me, she goes, hey, I'm just, I want this gig. I'll do anything. And she kind of looks down at my, you know, my waist. And I'm like going, whoa. And the bass player is kind of going, whoa. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I didn't know how to handle it because I was so young and inexperienced. So I said, well, follow me. We'll go find the, the, the stage production manager, right. which I did. And, of course, as soon as I opened the door and said, there's somebody here who wants to see you, he took a look at her, grabbed her, yanked her into his office and looked at me like, don't you ever come in here again and slammed the door. <laughs> and you could tell he was some broken nose, you know, Italian mob guy that was going to take it from there, if you know what I mean. Right, I got you. That's that's so, funny. So that was so, my first experience with, with one of the wise guys, like right. right in the middle of it, you know. <laughs> so is there a certain type of music you like to play, um, or do you just play everything? 
I played just about everything because I eventually became a studio musician. After I played on Diane's album in 1977, uh, I started, get, you know, of course, I got introduced to Jeff Picaro and Jay Graydon and, and um, uh, David Page. All these guys that eventually were in Toto. They were recommending me for gigs on bass because I read notation. I played great. And uh, I got brought in. So all of a sudden I started working as a studio musician. And when you do that, you start having to learn how to play all styles because... Okay. Calls from client, you know, clients and in you know contractors and stuff. And I mean, it could be anything from a hamburger commercial to playing on a movie soundtrack to playing on a big name record, you know, to just doing a jingle for a children's show. It could be anything, you know. So, you know, some of it's country, some of it's jazz, some of it's bluegrass, some of it's right. hard rock, you know, disco. I mean, you had to do everything. So I'm not really familiar with the whole idea of the session performers. The only thing I know is like the Wrecking Crew when I uh, with in in that's the idea in Los Angeles and the idea. So when you're part of a session um, band, do you always have work, or do they call you to come in when they need you? Are you under contract? You're not under contract. You're independent. You at those days before we had beepers, we had a service called My Girl Answering Service. Okay. And you would call them in the morning. You tell them, I'm going to be at this place. I'm going to be at this place. Here are the phone numbers where I'll be. And while you were working in those other sessions and other gigs, sometimes it was a live performance you were doing, but you would get a call from either a manager or a secretary that was in that building. And they would say, hey, you got a phone call here from your girl. And you go get on the phone. They say, yeah, I got a session at 8 o'clock tonight at Blah 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 Studio with such and such contractor. Be there. And that was it. And so it was kind of like an agent, but but they were just really a contact service. But they would keep track of where you were all day long, and they would make sure that you knew where the next gig was. So have you ever been in a situation back then where they would say, okay, we need you for a live performance, and yet you had no rehearsal time? Yeah, that was called a casual. And, of course, those those things are still going on, you know, the weddings and corporate right. parties and, you know, private parties, whatever, you know. And those were, usually came through a uh, uh, an agency that had a, what we call an office, which would book multiple bands for that day, uh, you know, and they would just throw together whatever sections they could get for that day. Now, m most of the time, it would be a week in advance, maybe two weeks in advance, for those types of gigs. But sometimes, yes, you'd get a call. Uh, you'd, sometimes a guy get a gig for a really good session. He couldn't do the schedule. So you get you get a call an hour before, as long as you can get there on time. Right. Oh, that's interesting. I would have never, I, I never do that. So I'm looking at your list of the people you, you perform with. Um, and I mentioned Donny Osmond, Wayne Newton, um, Peter Frampton, which your wife performed with him also. Um, but when you look at these names, I mean, you're literally going all over the board when you're performing. Yep. Oh, and when you, when you perform with Donny Osmond, how long were you with him? Oh, just one, one, one performance. Now, keep okay. in mind that the credits are for recording and playing live with. Okay. So it's one or the other. Right. With Donny, it was a, a show for Mark and Brian, who were on KLOS for many, many years on the main drive, rock and roll classic L.A. station, big time guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and they used to do all these really interesting events, one of which was a big Christmas show at the Palladium. I mentioned the Palladium earlier where my parents used to right. jitter. But, well, later on, they used to just rent the hall and have a big giant show there, their Christmas show. And it was a live show, which they would sell tickets to, but it was broadcast live on radio. Okay. It was before streaming. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and he was one of the guests, along with Kenny Loggins and God knows who else that day. There was a whole bunch of folks, I think, and Mark okay. Cohen. Uh, but anyway, he was just one of the people that was singing with us. And I was the MD, and I had to do the charts. Okay. They would send me a, a tape of whatever song and arrangement he was doing. I'd make a chart for it. Or if he already had charts, I would just make copies and make sure everybody in the band had copies. And we'd run over it and sound check for about five minutes. And then when he'd come up, we'd just play the song behind, you know, One Bad Apple. You play behind, he was on a chart. It's really easy. You've all heard it. And everybody's so good at playing. It's just like no big deal to play it, you know. So when did you get hooked up with the Steve Miller band? Uh, I was writing with a guy named Gary Malibur who had played drums on all of his big hits in the 70s. And Gary and I had had a band called Gerard McMahon and Kid Lightning in around 1980. 
And we had a couple record deals with that, and we were co-writers with Gerard, but we decided to break away from him and do our own thing, and we were writing and producing some stuff in Gary's garage, and we did it very well on an 8-track uh, TAC half-inch 15 IPS machine with DBX, so we were making like record-quality demos in his garage. Well, Steve Miller calls it in the winter of 1981. He says, I'm dry. I just got over divorce. I just stopped drinking. I got no inspiration. Right. I need material. I got to deliver a record by Christmas on Capitol Records. Do you have any material, Gary? And so Gary tells him about our band. He tells about our writing. We had about eight songs that we had just finished mixing, and we were getting ready to go for our own record deal with a band we had called Robbie Ubop. And when Steve heard our demos, because we agreed to let him hear them, he won it all. So he wiped us out. He took all <laughs> eight. And not only did he take the songs, but he wanted the masters because we had recorded them so great, as I had just mentioned. He transferred those to 24 track, took them to Capitol and started putting his voice and a couple guitars on. And I played bass and guitar on all of those demos. So now I'm on this new album with Steve Miller without ever even meeting him. Oh, that's interesting. Right. And so then he calls me while he's working on the tracks at Capitol. He goes, you know, I really dig your bass and guitar playing. So that spoke to him and my writing because I had three co-writes. Uh, he said, I love your writing. I love your bass playing. I love your guitar playing. Can you come down to Capitol and help me finish this album? And so, so what, was, what, was, what was the name of the album? Abracadabra. And the title song off the track is Abracadabra. Abracadabra. Yeah, sold so, 5 million copies worldwide. Which which is which is amazing. Yeah, it would be interesting to see what would have happened today if it would have been released to see how fast it would have traveled the world during streaming services and stuff like that. But yeah, it's it's hard to say. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting story and in how that that record got promoted. We don't have to belabor that right now. <laughs> but uh, but the thing that was really cool is that I had three songs on this album. I had the flip side of the, of the Abracadabra, which was a song called Never Say No. And at that time, I was a very busy studio musician. So when Steve asked me to join the band, the way he asked me was that, hey, I'm doing photos tomorrow for the album cover. Would you like to join the band and go on tour with me? That's how I got the call. And I had to make the decision, which was a very hard decision because right. I was really well in town. I didn't need to tour. And so I turned to Diane and I said, what do you think, Diane? And of course, at that time, she was just my girlfriend. And she says, well, you've had three record deals of your own. Uh, they've all flopped. Uh, You've always wanted to be in a band to promote your own material. Here's right. your chance. It's just that you won't be singing it. It'll be this guy, Steve Miller, singing it, who's already had hit records. So what's wrong with that? Right. And so, so it, it sort of made sense, you know. It's interesting because um, after talking to Diane and realizing that you were on Abracadabra, I decided to go back and, of course, look at YouTube. And at that time is when music videos were becoming popular. Yeah. And... I want to know who told Steve Miller that that music video was a good idea for that song. <laughs> Believe it or not, that video won an award. Did it really? And yep. again, it's amazing how technology has changed. Yes. It, it's, how, it's just awful. It's just got awful the way the storyboard went. But it won an award. I don't know how to explain it, but it won an award during those times. But in those days, the artists usually had nothing to do with their videos. Right. They were so unfamiliar with the, the genre that they would just turn it over to the label. They just said, you know, do a video. In fact, when we when that video was made, we were already on the road. We weren't even in town, you know, so they made that video on their own. If you notice, all, it's only still shots of us in the video. The actors they chose, uh, the set, you know, the storyboard, we had nothing to do with any of that. Because it... If you look at it by today's standard, it literally looks like it was thrown together at the last minute. Well, you should have seen some others that they had done. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was actually not that bad. They they did some others on our next album that I had with them, which was called Italian X-Rays. They were just god-awful. Oh, my <laughs> God. I mean, at least this thing had some dancing and some... Well, I get, you know, yeah. Some, you know, it was like vaudeville. And, <laughs> I mean, obviously, they were trying to key off magic, you know, with the birds. Oh, right. I got you. I, mean, I, I understand the premise, but again, looking back, because I was, when that came out, and this will tell you how old I am, which was, what, not 82, I was a sophomore in high school. 
So this is what I was listening to. I mean, we were listening to the Steve Miller band. We were we were following them and everything else. And I actually think I missed going to one of your concerts because of weather, if I remember correctly. But it, it's like one of those things. This is what we were listening to. This is this is exactly what it was. And I can guarantee my 16 year old self saw that video and thought it was wonderful because we didn't know any better. Because again, it was 1982. Now my 55 year old self looked at it, going, "Yeah, I think someone should have thought that all the way through." I mean, all that's those, been... almost all those MTV videos were pretty bad. I mean, there was only a couple that stick out in my mind that might have been kind of cool. Uh, you know, like what we got into the police, like around 84, yes. 85. Right. Some of their stuff started looking pretty good. You know, uh, Duran Duran. They had a couple that looked okay. <laughs> you know, but most of them. I mean, we're just yeah. not awful. I mean, we think about Cindy Lauper and Boy George, and you know, yeah. all, you know, I mean, some of that stuff was just like, what are they doing? You so, know? is it hard for you to believe that that was forty years ago that that song? Is it hard to believe? Yeah. <laughs> kind of, but uh, it feels like forty. It's, it feels like a really long time ago. Does it? It does. Because I, I, to me, that's just amazing. Because I think at my age i still see myself as 26 years old even though i don't physically look it but i feel that way um, oh, come so on. come on bill you look great <laughs> thank you that's why they say i have a face for radio um but looking through these other bands so how many years and i know you're playing with steve miller now how many years were you with him um as as part of the band well, in, in 82 is when we okay. toured, so it's been 40 years. 40 years. And were you with him all for a solid 40 years, or were you? No. In, in 1987, he did a jazz album called Born to be Blue. It was yep. his last album on Capitol, and uh, he decided to go with a different rhythm section. He was being produced by an old schoolmate friend of his named Ben Sidron, who was a pretty famous jazz kind of guy. And he co-wrote Space Cowboy with Steve. Oh, okay. And he rearranged the song and did kind of a smooth jazz kind of version of it. And Steve was so impressed by Ben's, you know, production on this song, he decided to let him produce a whole album on it. So they did an album of, like, jazz standards and goofy, kind of, you know, Will We Weep For Me and Little Red Top and Zippity Doo Dah. I mean, it was yeah, just like... I I heard the zippity doodah, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, well, I had nothing to do with that album. He used his rhythm section. Right. But Steve sent me the album, and he said, hey, I just did this album with this rhythm section. What do you think? And I think he wanted me to tour with him, because you know, he always loved my guitar playing. And I listened to it, and I went, I don't know what you're doing. I don't think your fans are going to know what this was. Right. I said, I don't even think the label's going to let you release it. And he went nuts. He went, oh, you're crazy. This is the best album I've ever done, and I'm going to be a big, smooth jazz singer now. I'm going into the mature part of my life, and I need to get away from this rock and roll crap and blah, 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 blah. You know, this is before his greatest hits album hit. Yeah. You know, and it was like, I was like, I think you're nuts. And so he didn't talk to me for six years <laughs> because I told him that. And guess what? The record label wouldn't release his album. So he had to sue them on contractual uh, loophole that said right. that he had artistic control, blah, blah, blah. And he forced them to put that record out, which totally bombed. You know, so I was right, but I had to pay, uh, uh, I had to pay the, uh, the price of six years of being, you know, shunned because right. I told the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so other than Steve Miller, have you performed with other bands for long periods of time? Uh, not for long periods of time. No, you know, most uh, of my gigs have been with, uh, my live gigs have been with, you know, bands that I've put together, which are like all-star bands. Like I have a band called the hang dynasty. You can look at that up online, the hang dynasty.com, uh, H A N G not Han, but hang dynasty. And, uh, it's a bunch of celebs that have worked with all the big name acts and we go out and do shows and, uh, we, we've toured with that. I even did a little bit of that with JBL. I did a two-week tour with them with Steve Lukather as a guest guitar player. I had the Tower of Power horn section. Uh, it was my band, and it was sponsored by JBL Harmon. And we were really selling gears, what we were doing, but it was fun. But uh, that's the kind of stuff I've done. You know, I, I haven't really toured with a major, major act other than Steve. Okay. Most of the time, the reason being is most of the time when I'd stay in town, I'd be writing and producing and doing studio work, which paid very well. And I didn't need to go out on the road to do that. But then eventually that dried up. 
And then that's around the time that Steve got back in touch with me and says, hey, I'm doing rock and roll again. You want to come back in the band? And that was in 1993. So I had a six-year break. That's when Diane and I had our first child, uh, Sierra. And we were able to raise her. I was able to stay in town. I was able to work for J. Bill and Harmon. Uh, I was selling Rivera guitar amps. I was doing, you know, other types of things in the music industry. And then when he said, you want to come back out, he built his business back up. I said, sure. And so I went out back with him, and I've been with him since 93. And then he took another break himself from 2001 to 2004. He just decided to quit for a while. And that's when I worked for Guitar Center in artist relations sales. I, I and, saw that. So, so what does... Back up in 2004, and we've been going ever since. So what I, I saw that your, your, your thing with Guitar Center, what did they have you do? I was the artist relations sales manager. I would actually like deal directly with big names. I would have their okay. credit cards on my laptop and I could send them gear anywhere in the world at any time, okay. including Pro Tools, you know, audio software oh, yeah. systems. I mean, I was a big time sales guy, and, but I was like, because I was a rock and roller and I had a ponytail and boots and, and Levi's, they trusted me. I didn't look like a suit, you know, right. and so I was selling gear to all the stars. So you've probably been asked this question before, but I'll ask it anyhow. Would you rather just write or would you rather perform live? You know, it's funny you mention that because I actually have a novel that I've written that's on Amazon right now that's done very well on its own. I self-published it. I'm shopping an agent right now with the sequel, and I'm going up to my cabin in a week to tune that up before I try to go for another round of agents. And... I would really, at this point in my life, love to become uh, a novelist, a okay. writer, a book writer. Okay. And songs, you know, I mean, nobody cares about my songs anymore. Almost all the songs that are hitting these days are either written by the artists or the producers who are producing them. It's very hard to get a song placed now with an artist. Uh, you don't have, like, Frank Sinatra's and Debbie Reynolds and Doris Day and, you know... I mean, I mean, even Linda Ronstadt had to have material, you know, but I mean, right. at least you could try to get your song to her and see if she liked it. Well, nowadays, Don Waz or somebody like that would be producing her, and he'd probably write them all, or his friend, his co-writer friend, you know. I mean, it's so inside, it's so hard to get that stuff uh, exposed to other people that it, the likelihood of you making any money writing songs anymore for other people is nil. Yeah, because there's so many songs, you know, and there's so many really good small studios that are digital that people have, like this one right here. I make records at this place that you're looking at. It's a, right. mess. It's a mess right now because I just did a gig Saturday. I threw everything in here. But I make <laughs> records in here. I have a record now that I recorded in here that's up for a NAMI right now, which is a Native American Music Award, and they're voting on it right now. So I made it right here, you know. So, so there's no studio work because I do all the work. I don't have to hire anybody. And I, and um, myself and the artist wrote the song. So no other writers could get involved in that, you know. So unless you admit it yourself, it's really hard to make money writing songs. The only place that you can really do it uh, and have any money is to have a big library online that people borrow little pieces from to stick in television and movie clips. And it's called a needle drop because back in the yeah. old days, you just drop the needle. Well, now it's just little snippets, 10, 15, 20, 30 second pieces. Those things you can get a sync license for. And you can pay a couple grand, maybe up even to 10, 50 grand, depending upon how big the production is. You can make money doing that, but it's not like writing a beautiful piece of music. It's just little pieces of snippets that they plug in to you know uh, uh, an audio soundtrack do you ever think it will go back the way it was or do you think it, the industry has changed totally i mean i don't know if it's for the better or the, for the worse it depends on what side you're on but back then and, it, and i hate to use the term back then it seems like there was so much more creativity that everybody had a shot that if they wanted to do it and they wanted to work at it they had a shot maybe they may didn't make it nationally but they could do regionally local whatever it may be now well, that's, that's it's still that way it's just now instead of playing regionally like you say which is a physical area it's on the internet so if right. you get 10,000 people online who love your stuff and you put out 10 songs for a dollar a piece 
that's a hundred thousand dollars. Ah, it's true. Yeah. I'll buy it, yeah. and that money comes directly to you. There's no label involved, and you get all that money. And there's nothing wrong with that. So, are you are you doing some of that too, or are you just? I'm trying to. You okay. know, uh, I don't pursue it so much on the song level for myself, but I produce other acts where I either co-write or I co-publish the songs. And if they have like success like this one that's up for Nami right now, I mean. I have half the publishing on that. So that means that if that song ever gets picked up in a movie or a television show or something and they do a sync license, I will get paid. So with the music you have written, um, has anything been picked up like that before that would be out there yes. in the public coffers other than what Steve Miller played? A time ago, I had a song called Why Can't I Fall in Love that I co-wrote with a friend of mine, John Finley, and it was in a movie called Pump Up the Volume with Christian Slater. And uh, Ivan, Ivan Neville sang that. The guy that's in okay. Oh, okay. Aaron Neville's son. Yeah. And uh, he sang it. And uh, it was on a soundtrack that, that did pretty well because there was a lot of big groups on there. It was Soundgarden, uh, Chris Cornell, you know, uh, Concrete Blonde. Uh, at, uh, I can't remember all the bands, but, you know, uh, Tim Book Three, you know, got a feature so bright, got to wear shades, you know, those. Shades. Yeah. So anyway, it was like 1990. So that soundtrack sold pretty well. We made a good sync license to have it go in the movie. And then we made pretty good royalties on the sales of the soundtrack. That was that was a long time ago, though. That was 32 years ago. Yeah, uh, which, it was again, is hard to believe. Have you noticed um, when you're touring, and I know I know the whole pandemic has thrown a wrench into the works with, with being able to tour over the last two years. Yeah. But were you noticing the... The crowds coming out to see Steve Miller, are they older or are they a mix of a younger and older crowd? They're, they're a mix because what happened was is when Steve's Greatest Hits came out on a CD in 1987, mm -hmm. compact disc, ooh, right. all the college what kids. Are those? Yeah. And that new generation all started learning all the lyrics and becoming fans. And then they all went and had kids. And then they started playing those CDs when their kids were growing up. So those kids grew up with Steve. And then now they're 20, 30 years old. And they're coming around. They know all the lyrics. So we've got 80-year-olds all the way to 20, 25-year-olds, you know, that know our material because of the way it's overlapped with different generations. Because of the music that you, that you were a part of with Steve Miller and the stuff that you wrote, and I've always I've said this to my kids. My oldest is 21. My youngest is 14. I said that the music that I grew up listening to, we will be hearing forever. The music they're listening to is questionable. And I know my parents said the same thing and everything else. But do you see where you're going to have bands with the staying power like Steve Miller that have just started within the last five years. Do you see Harry Styles going that far, being able to keep an audience like that? Or do you just think because the music is just so, I want to say a lot of it's fake in my mind, there's really no talent behind it. Do you see that music disappearing and your stuff still going on? I mean, for, for goodness sake, Frank Sinatra is still being played. Nationally. I would say somebody like a John Mayer and somebody like okay. an Ed Sheeran. Okay. Uh, that somebody like, um, I, uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of some of the younger bands uh, that are writing really good new stuff uh -huh. uh, that really, really is indelible. Um, Adele. Um, oh, there's, okay, yeah. There's going to be some artists that are going to keep playing when we're on space stations. And they'll be right alongside the Joker and Fly Like an Eagle, right. you know, all that other stuff. But those artists are writing some really good stuff that are, is going to be around for a while. Because I, yeah. I just think... Yeah. Adele only really co-writes because she doesn't really write just off the top of her head. It's not like a Neil Young or a... Right. Or but, but she is getting involved in that process, which is helping her become more, you know, realized. Ed Sheeran, he writes his own stuff, and it's pretty catchy, man. It's going to be around in a long time. You know, uh, Bruno Mars, if he's writing, he'll probably be remembered for some stuff. Uptown Funk, went down. but I think it was, I think that I don't think he wrote that. I think that was uh, dumb, uh, but, uh, Daft, Daft Punk wrote that. So you know, it's hard to say. You know, uh, the artist will be connected to the hit, and then it'll be whatever it is, but it'll be remembered. So whatever the combination is that's going with that 
will be remembered, you know. But there are some songs that will be remembered from this new generation. Generation. I can't, um, I can't name them all right now, <laughs> but those are the few that I just I came to the top of my head, you know. Because um, part of me, and I mean, and Diane knows this too, that I do a uh, um, an air shift Monday through Friday from noon until three on an oldie station does classic rock, and then I do a Sunday night program that does more uh, – deep archive uh, rock and roll from the fifties and sixties. And we're noticing that that genre of music, which Steve Miller fits into, especially the stuff from the 1970s and early eighties, that we're noticing we're gar garnering more listeners over time. And it's, yeah. and I think it's like you said, because of the whole idea of streaming services now and all this, that these kids are finding it without yeah without really looking for it. They can put in Steve Miller and it'll bring up a list of everything he's done or everything that you've done. Right. Most classic rock radio stations base their, you know, programming on the metrics of, you know, how many units, how many plays, you know, right. I mean, it's just based upon numbers. So Steve's just fortunate enough that his stuff has been played so much and sold so well that it gets on rotation about every hour on the hour on a classic rock station. One of his six big hits will be playing, you know, yeah. and he's fortunate enough that that's happened. So that's been his, his golden goose. And so that's why we're able to go out and tour because that, that, radio station, whether it's Terra, Terra or XM, right. supports people coming out to see us, you know, and we're still playing pretty big sheds. We're not having to play theaters all the time. We're still well, playing. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. We get 10 um, to 15,000 people, you know. Which is which is fantastic. And I'll be honest with you, when I'm on the air, and if there's not one in my rotation stead, I pull Steve Miller in just, but don't tell my program director that because <laughs> it's what I enjoy listening to, but I'm not supposed to do that. Um when, when you're performing with large groups like that um, and with, with staying power in front of large groups of people, do you see your, your touring career going on indefinitely until you want to quit? Or do you think there's going to be a peak where it's just going to start dying down? The only reason why there'd be a peak and start dying down is that the artists themselves are going to die. Okay. I, I think the listeners are still going to be interested even when the Rolling Stones are 80. You know, and aren't and they eighty now? <laughs> the drummer was. He was. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they're getting close. Uh, and so Steve. Steve is seventy-eight this year. Oh, really? So, you know, we're getting up there. Exactly. So that's what's going to happen. It's just we're just going to not we. I mean, I'm I'm oh, sorry. Right, I got you. I'm 67. I'll still be going. I think I'll probably be doing the tribute act of the Steve Miller band. Who knows? But uh, it's going to be around. Uh, the music won't die. The artist might, but the music won't die. And in the case of Steve, for instance, he's not a very visually recognizable person unless you're a big fan. So yeah. it wouldn't really matter who was singing. Like Foreigner. When you go hear Foreigner now, yeah. you, are you familiar with them? Foreigner? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When you go see Foreigner, there's nobody original in the band, but they still sell out well, and they still sound great, and the people have a great time, and nobody cares whether they're the original people or not. It's just really good writing, you know. And, and that and that's that's true because I never thought of that. Recently, I had I had the pleasure and the honor to see um, Mickey Dolans and Mike Nesmith right before Mike Nesmith passed away in their final tour. And that's when me when I started thinking about these the, the older performers is do they they keep pushing themselves because they enjoy doing it or do they feel they have an obligation to their fans that they have to do it? It's both. You know, it's it's a little bit of the addiction of the rush and adrenaline of hearing the crowd roar, but also the money. Uh, it's kind of a combination of both. And it's a it's a it's a it's a wicked web that is weaved. Is it? And, and you feel like you're being enveloped by a spider or something, you know, and it's because it's like you, you keep saying every every time you get off the tour, oh, this is going to be my last time. I'm not playing those toilets. Right. Anymore. I'm not going to take that shit off that promoter, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's like, and then the next, you know, come be, come time right after the holidays, you get cabin fever. You're going to the manager, hey, what do you got going? He's got some gigs going. <laughs> I'm going nuts over here, you know. So that always so happens. You know. So with the Steve Miller band, when are you guys going to start performing again? Or are you doing that right now? 
Well, we did a few things at the end of last year, and then Omicron hit in the holidays, and we had a gig in February that we were going to do that was a private that was already moved from last summer when everything got canceled, and then they decided to cancel it because it was, you know, right. worried about Omicron was hitting hard, blah, blah, blah. So now it's been pushed to the summer. So our first dates coming up are going to be two nights at the Venetian in Las Vegas, March uh, 13th and 14th. And then we are going to be doing a three-day festival in Redondo Beach, of which we are closing on the 15th. So 13, 14, 15 is Vegas, Vegas, Redondo Beach. And those are our first three dates coming up in May that we're going to start kicking off, you know, whatever we're going to do this year. Right. Because I, I would love to see it come back towards the East Coast. Because, like I said, I'm in the Pittsburgh area. <laughs> a gig this morning. What's that? We just booked a Connecticut gig this morning. Oh, okay. So you are going to be doing the East Coast then sometime. Well, one. So one. But, but <laughs> well, you got to start somewhere, as I say. We usually do anywhere between 50 to 60 dates a year. I think this year it's going to be more like 20 to 25. Okay. Now, when you tour, does Diane tour with you? Not as a performer. She just comes out and visits and, and okay. hangs out. Because she made a comment that she sang on a couple of things that you've done. Other than her work. Yes. That was back in 1984. We had an album called uh, Italian X-Rays. And I wrote a song on there called Shangri-La, which was the single, but it just didn't fly because we weren't paying the payola like everybody else was. Uh, so we didn't gotcha. But she sang a part of the end that sounded like Ema Sumac on one of those old 50s sci-fi movies, real high like a theremin kind of a part. Yes. And it was really cool. And uh, she sang on that. And uh, that was, and then she did other rock and roll people's records. She sang on a Rod Stewart record. I think she sang with me on a Billy Preston record that we uh, produced as a band. Uh, my band that I had at the time, Pieces, we produced uh, uh, Billy Preston. Uh, she sang back runs on that. So, you know, she's, and then, and then she, I mean, like we were on a gig in 93 with Paul McCartney. He had her and I come out and start singing Hey Jude with him, you know. Yeah, I know. I, that was fun. You know, so that's the kinds of things she spills over onto. Yeah, I, I saw that. And she mentioned that to me whenever I talked to her. And, of course, I was able to find it while she was talking to me, which was so interesting mm -hmm. to be able to talk to her, realizing that she performed with McCartney. Ringo was there. You were there. And then just going through that list of names. Um so when you go through this, you mentioned Billy Preston, and you you were the you were his band on his her, his album recording, correct? Right. There was just an album he did. It was around eighty three. I want to say eighty two or eighty three. Uh, and it was you know he he'd already kind of had his career, and right. this was kind of a follow up record. And he really liked what we were doing. We were making some disco records in Europe at that time because disco was still going on in Europe. Yeah. We had a band called LAX, and you could go on YouTube and listen to all the LAX hits. And that's my band, Pieces, that we had a deal that was Blue Eyed Soul, kind of like Pablo Cruz meets Holland Oats, whatever. And by the time the 80s rolled around, Blue Eyed Soul was gone. Even Michael McDonald and Bobby Caldwell and Holland Oats, all those people, they were kind of washed out by then. And it was all the knack and the cure and, you know, and like... Total 80s weird rock and roll new wave. We didn't do that. We were doing Blue Eyed Soul, so our record kind of got washed out. But we were still making these disco records in Europe with another name. And Billy loved it. He wanted our rhythm section and he wanted our production sound. So basically, we got the gig. And so we helped him with that record. And uh, I can't remember the name of the album, uh, Stepping Out or something like that. Right. Uh, we I played bass on that whole album and sang some backgrounds. Because because when you think about it, I mean, Billy Preston, I mean, for those of you that, that don't know who he was, I mean, he did, he worked with the Beatles, he worked with Big in the 70s, but that had to say something to you that he wanted your rhythm section to yeah, be he, able to. He did, bang, he did Bangladesh with George Harrison. Yeah. So, again, just looking through all that, and then I'm looking at some of the other names, you, Mark Lindsay. Um, and, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he signed me to my first record deal. Did he really? Yeah, because he was working for EMI Liberty Records. Oh, actually, UA Liberty Records at the time. And uh, he just loved my band pieces, and uh, he just he loved us. And we got signed. We finished the record. This is the Blue Eyed Soul record I'm telling you about. Yeah. And then when it was released, 
EMI Capital bought that label, fired Mark. He was no longer our, our hero. And then they were kind of looking at us like, who are you guys? Who are you guys, yeah. No, we didn't sign you. What are we going to do with you? You know, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that happens. You work all your life to get a record deal, and you get a mentor that signs you, and then he gets fired. Yeah, and that has to be deflating right then and there, going, oh, my goodness, what do we do now? It happened to like, Diane. Her record that I did with her was uh, an ABC Dunhill record. Otis Smith was her mentor. Along comes MCI. Yeah. Uh, yeah, MCI Records buys it out, or MCA, sorry, MCA Records buys that out, and they fire Otis, and she's an orphan. Right. Same thing. Both of us. Uh, it happened to both of us. It, that, that, that's interesting. So when you go through this, and I'm looking at another name, and unfortunately he passed away a couple weeks back, is Meatloaf. Yeah, I, we worked with him in 93. We toured with him in Australia. How was that? Because there's, there's stories that he's just totally off the ed- was off the edge when he did anything. Well, I mean, what do you want to know? I mean, we toured with him. He was great. He was, you know, doing his show. Uh, all, I would do anything, but, you know, that, right. that. And then, he, of course, he had this girl on stage, and he was dressed up with, you know, he looked like Beauty and the Beast, and she was mm-hmm. beautiful, and he was the Beast, and he was trying right. to you really know, relate to her, and she was in love with him, but she couldn't really, you know, it's like, yeah. it, it was a lot of drama, and Todd Rundgren produced it, of course, and of course, I actually know Todd, too, I was going to be in Utopia at one point, so I'm connected with that whole New York arty, arty scene, and that's what that was, it was Todd Rundgren's arty, you know, Greenwich Village meets something bigger, Beacon Theater, or whatever, uh, kind of drama with Broadway thrown in. And I saw that on stage and it was working and people were really affected by the relationship between him and the girl. And uh, they forgave him for being this big guy. And of course, I'm a big guy too. And he and I hit it off right away. I found out he was a shot putter, that he was a lineman uh, uh, in football. And he and I had very similar upbringings and we, we got along great. Oh, really? Now, yeah. off your professional career doing that, so during the pandemic, you were teaching online, correct? Yes, and I have a, a YouTube channel, Kenny Lee Lewis, and I have a Fret Friends, F-R-E-T, F-R-E-N-Z, Fret Friends uh, playlist on there that people can go to, and there's all kinds of free videos and performances, and I, I show how to you know, layer a hit record, I show how to play bass and guitar, I show how to sing, lyrics, all kinds of stuff. I do interviews with a lot of celebrity people. And at the, at the end of it, I invite people to go to my fretfriends.com website, which is a teaching website, which I'm overhauling right now because okay. I'm having to kind of rethink the way I'm doing it. So it's kind of off right now. But if people can make a footnote to just look up fretfriends.com, F-R-E-T-F-R-N-E-N-Z, at some point, I'll have that launching in the next month or so again, and it'll be uh, in-person lessons on Zoom, but there'll also be library video lessons that people can access as master classes. So all that will be available uh, in the next month. So, and, I, and, I, and I'll ask you this because my oldest son, who did take guitar lessons um, when he was younger, how, and, and it was in person, how can you teach someone how to play a guitar via a computer screen? I mean, because you're not able to. It's, it's tough because you got to really have multiple cameras, okay. not only on the teacher, but you really need them on the student too. So you can see the fingers and how they're moving and the elbows and the wrists and, the, you know, the forearms. And it's all like tennis, you know, so it's kind of tough on Zoom. Now, if you have people that are somewhat uh, proficient, then it's not so bad. Then you're just showing techniques and right. where to put your, you know, strummy techniques, things like that. And that works okay. But with a kind of a beginner, when you really need to get in there and help them with the physical histronics and stuff, it's tough. You almost have to do it person, uh, person to person. So what made you want to do this? Well, I've been a teacher all my life. I was a teacher when I was 17 years old. I was working in a music store. I was teaching guitar, bass, and flute that far back. Really? Yeah. So you so you play flute too. I played flute and I played flute and I played trombone in college because I had to learn how to read notation and the best way to learn how to read notation is to get in an orchestra and a lot of times orchestras didn't have guitar or bass parts that you could play, you know. So you'd learn the flute to learn how to play the range of the guitar, then you learn the trombone how to play the range of the bass. Interesting. 
I w- my daughter plays flute. She's a freshman. And my 21 year old who's graduating from college when he was in high school, he played euphonium. So oh. I have no musical talent whatsoever. Lucky for them, their mother played trumpet when she was in high school because I have none whatsoever. But I just I just find that interesting because I for some reason, like I said, I I I love music. I love listening to it. I occasionally try to sing along. I don't know how good that is, but it amazes me how you're able to tell me all this stuff is connected together. And when I see a brass instrument, I see a brass instrument. I don't see anything else or a flute. You've heard of right brain and left brain people. Yes. I'm sure. Well, you're obviously right brain analytical and I'm left brain uh, more uh, intuitive. Okay. And so there, there are two very viable personalities that are important to our, <laughs> to our human species to be a right. part of our, our structure. And we need leaders, we need bean counters, we need, you know, fiscally responsible Republicans as well as we need ecologically sound and solar. I'm getting solar panels put in right now if you're hearing the, pound, the pounding. Yeah, that let solar panel going up my let roof. Let me know how they work because we're oh, talking about doing the same thing here. Been through it, I've already had, but my, my neighbor next door has them. It's great. So it's going to be wonderful. So but anyway, those are the kind of parts of what makes our country so great. Right. We have this democracy that allows us to swing in these directions, and we need both of them. And that the kind of brains we have are the, the tool, the foundation of, of what makes us who we are. You know, most artists, uh, you know, especially Libras, if you're in astrology, almost all my friends that are musicians are Libras or Geminis or whatever, you know, <laughs> and they're all able to balance you know, all these different things that allow them to be artistically creative. Diane is a Libra, my wife. Okay. Yeah. And so we we look at things a little more creatively and we paint in these broad strokes and, you know, and we're, you know, always just, you know, we, it's like Van Gogh compared to uh, uh, Renoir, you know, or not Renoir, uh, Rembrandt. Rembrandt okay. was a musician. Mm-hmm. Van Gogh was a broad stroking impressionistic you know they're different different brains you know it's different so a lot of times analytical right brain people do have trouble crossing into the intuitive uh thing that allows music and painting and singing and right. creating writing it's, it's sometimes it's difficult for them to to, to to get into that because they're always asking questions they're always analytically trying to figure it out it's intellectual brain tissue yeah. And we, over, and we overthink it. And we don't just let it happen. Yeah, right. I understand that. My oldest, my oldest son, 21, he is a theater major in college. He's graduating um, in May. And now he's out. I don't know where he's at today, but he's auditioning for New York for Broadway and for stuff like that. That's part of his thing. He's going to Tennessee later this month. So I get where it comes from because I come, I live in a household where I have someone that is left brained and is able to do that. And luckily for my son and my daughter, they're in a school that still um, values the arts, but we're noticing nationwide where the arts are being removed from school. Well, that's been going on for decades. But do you? But it's getting worse now. But have you know? Are you? When that happens, do you see society changing? Oh, absolutely. Uh, for the better or for the worse? For the worse, you know, okay. because if you're not, if you don't have an outlet to express yourself other than words, yeah. then you are cut off from being able to communicate with your fellow man, if you will, and it makes you become isolated, makes you a hermit, and it eventually may make you suicidal. And I got to say, during the Vietnam War, if I hadn't had my classic rock music and my guitar, I might have just offed myself. I mean, I didn't want to go over there. Right. My older friends that were going were coming back maimed or weren't coming back at all. Yeah, because what, what, what scares me, and, I, and I've made this comment before, is that, yeah, we, we all need to work. We all need to do that 40-hour work week or whatever it may be. But what do we do in our free time? How do we relax? How do we unwind? And if you think about it, if we didn't have the arts or entertainment, we'd be going crazy. Yeah. Because we have to, and again, like you said, we have to have a way to escape. 
That is your escape. You know, I mean, some people can escape just with the sound of an ocean track off of a, you know, iPhone. Yeah, that's no, that's yeah. no fun. <laughs> well, but I mean, you can. Oh, no, I know. <laughs> no. Into a space, you know, doing that. But that's just one little small, small thing. But I mean, with, with art and music, you have interpretation, you have an emotion, you have a connection, you might even have a history, who knows. But all those things keep you fed with stimulation that augments your physiology. I mean, even vibrations will cause your blood to flow in a direction that is healthy. Magnetism, vibration, frequencies, certain frequencies that are you know, you know, that's why they have those bowls and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Bells. I mean, it aligns your cheese and it makes your blood flow a certain way and it brings down your blood pressure and it's just healthy, you know. And so sometimes just sitting there playing a guitar at three in the morning, even if you don't know how to play it, but you just know maybe a chord or you tune it to a chord. That's what right. David, when you read about the Psalms that David did in the, in the Old Testament. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. He had this little thing called a lyre, and he would just tune it to a chord, whatever weird chord he felt like, and he would just sit there and strum it, and then he would just sit there and he would write the psalms. Huh. Ring, and he'd listen, and he'd meditate, and he'd listen to the vibration, and he'd just write the psalms. That's what he did. Well, Kenny, thank you very much. This was a total pleasure. And um, when when the book that you're writing, since you're going away to the cabin next week, um, next well, time it comes out. I already have a book out now that's for sale. It's right. my first book of this trilogy. If you go to Amazon.com and you just look up Skeleton Dolls, Children of the Tower, that's available in hardback and Kindle. It's my first book of the of the trilogy. Oh, the it's done cool. without any promotion whatsoever. I've never had an agent or a publisher, well, so we, you know it's well, done. For, people I'll can help buy. You. We'll start. We'll start promoting it. Give them by that, but. The sequel that I just wrote for it is the one that I'm shopping now as a fresh okay. meat piece because publishers won't talk to you if you've already self-published. You know? Oh, yeah. I, I've, I've talked to a few authors in the past that have told me the same thing. But mm -hmm. I'd love to have you back on again. There's so many more questions I have for you, and I really appreciate it. Tell Diane I said hi. I will. And, and before I let you go, is there anything you want to tell my audience mm -hmm. uh, mentioning the websites again, all this other stuff that you're doing, and just – having how they can get in touch with you or find you if you want to get in touch with me go to kenny lee lewis.com which is my home website uh, there's an info page there you can send me an email there if you have any questions if you'd like to take uh lessons online in on zoom or Streamyard or facetime whatever you want to do we can arrange that through that uh like i said if you want to hear what my bands are like i have a band that's called barflies with diane b-a-r-f-l-y-z music barfliesmusic.com there's videos i have another one called friends f-r-e-n-z music.com that's a classic rocks band that we do original material in i also have a latin jazz group that i'm working around town with that's supernova no website yet but my classic uh, my, my celebrity one that i was telling you about that's yes. h-a-n-g dynasty.com okay. And just go there, look at the videos, check it out. Maybe you might want to have a, our band come play your company party or something. You know, well, we, uh, We've done a lot of them. Well, Kenny, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, can't wait to talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, a big thank you goes out to Kenny Lee Lewis for joining me today. Boy, what a pleasure that was. I really enjoyed that. And I have so many more questions now. So hopefully we can get back on the program soon. So again, thank you very much, Kenny, for joining me. And thank you for watching and listening to us here on the Bill Alexander Show. Everybody, you have a great one. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to The Bill Alexander Show. The Bill Alexander Show is a million-dollar baby production. For more information, go to thebillalexandershow.com.